Hi everyone. Uh, this photo is going to be in English, but if you want to make questions at the end, I assume there is translation, or I can translate ish in Catalan as well. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So uh, I don't know. Sophia? Do we have Nandini already here? Maybe you can uh, you can say to people yeah. to come because we're going to start. Ah, okay. Yeah. Like there is people just around. So yeah. <laughs> Hi, Nandini. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so, so my name is Sofia. I'm a researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I'll be moderating this panel. I'm very excited that it's going to be centered on feminist and decolonial perspectives on artificial intelligence, talking about uh, like alternative non-hegemonic perspectives on practices and ideas of how to think of technology, uh, particularly an AI. And we have two amazing panelists, which are going to introduce themselves. Uh, so it's Nandini Chami, <laughs> who is uh, here with us online. And then we have Ryan Hara. So Nandini, if you want to uh, present yourself first. Uh, can you uh, hear me clearly, I hope? Uh, so, uh, I am a researcher with uh, IT for Change, and we are a not-for-profit organization working in India uh, at the intersections of digital technologies and social change. And our mission is to promote social justice, gender equality, and a decolonial development paradigm for the Global South. The strategies that we use in our work uh, span research, policy engagement at both the global and national level, field practice, and institutional capacity building for addressing the connectivity paradox, by which I mean the irony when increased inclusion in connectivity is, br is bringing greater labor exploitation and economic inequality and social inequality. And in our work, we aim to challenge the power of big tech to build a new social contract for data that is based on a feminist knowledge paradigm and the logic of commoning, and to strengthen the capabilities of people's institutions and local communities to pursue bottom-up data for development pathways, and to co-create a vision of digital justice for the global south through multi-constituency dialogue and influencing mainstream discourse. Uh, I'll just like uh, stop here for the moment. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And now our next panelist is Rajan, who can we put the presentation? Has a presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stand up because I don't like being sitting okay. down. Okay. <laughs> you want to, You can use our podium. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Like, yeah. I'm not a podium person. <laughs> um, do we have the presentation? One second. Great. Well, I can just say my name then. <laughs> um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Rayen. I come from Chile and I am the co-founder of Radical Data, a collective uh, with also Joe who is around here. Um, and we live in Amsterdam but we are here in Barcelona visiting and uh, coming for the festival and we are very, very excited to share our perspective uh, here. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about the Global South perspectives on data activism and why we think this is important. Um, I'm going to bring uh, my thoughts and my questions on it without, without necessarily like an answer, but I want to share the concepts of my research that I've been doing lately and bring it to the front because I truly, truly believe that the way that in the so Global South we engage with activism, political action, can be a clue for the activisms in all around the world regarding data and technology. Uh, so I'm going to change this. So I'm going to share, this is our first image that I just want to put in the front because it's always in my head when I think about activism in Latin America. And this is from the Estallido Social, the revolution that happened in 2019 in Chile. And for me it's an image that really shows up the messiness of an activism that comes from a very, very strong need for a community that decides to go to the streets without not knowing what is the outcome? What is the goal? What are they are building towards? But they need to step out and say, stop this. We need dignity, we need freedom, we need collectivity. And this, all this happened 
in a total mess, as you can see. It's a mix of people, it's a mix of community, there is a lot of dissent, there is uh, violence, there are people who is, wants to be everything pacifist, there is people who is dancing in the streets, there is people throwing uh, uh, rocks to the police, and there is also people throwing colonial uh, statues around the city. And all this to share that the concepts I'm gonna uh, show you after are part of all that trying to understand that messiness, you know, like it's not like a clean answer of every concept, instead it's, if you see like all these words for me come from like between these bodies and through those flags uh, all together at the same time and it's actually very problematic but I'm really happy to share those problems with you. So, um, I'm just gonna show this uh, slide right now in the presentation, but we're gonna come back to it later and also bring examples because with radical data, what we try to bring and what I want to bring to this panel as well today is how the practices we do every day in our activisms are so relevant for thinking about data, thinking about technology, thinking about our present, but also about our future. It's really about practicing and how do we engage with those practices. So I'm gonna go through the like the whole perspective, which I think can be like a very strong drive from the Global South activisms rooted in hope, a hope that we can sustain to keep alive and to keep fighting towards the things that we think are important. Also towards joy and celebration, and at the same time we are protesting, we are partying, we are having tea with our neighbours, and then we are in a committee and, or an assembly. Also political imagination, the relevance of thinking about through new hor horizons that not necessarily exist, but they can reference also things that also happened in the past, in past revolutions. And the very, very relevant point is about thinking about communities and thinking about ourselves from a non-victimization perspective, which I think also is very, very important to bring to Europe and to the North, which all the NGO system exists, where all orga big organizations also exist. And for me, it's something to really discuss on the problems of victimizing people. And I think from the Global South, we think about the agency of ourselves as not victims, instead of people with an agency and power to work towards their own liberations. Also, the ethics, which is rooted in experiences and needs, it means like the people who build the movements is people who is experiencing from those needs, and I think that's very, very, very important as well. The resistance as a way of life, I think I'm going to come back to this after because I probably I'm in the five minutes, but there is a lot of things to share about this. The collectivity, the idea of dissent, the idea of interdisciplinarity, we need to build a movement not just by tech people, not just by people who come from data, not just for, by hackers. We need to be working with plumbers, with teachers, with doctors, with people who clean the streets and with everyone who is part of the society. And at the end, a way of thinking on the tactics, which are also I'm going to enter more in what it means, this flexibility, and working without permission as well, which I think is something very, very important to bring to this context. But I'm going to come back then after to this concept and how those concepts apply on our practices and our trying our attempts with radical data and also other examples of the Global South. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, can we see? <laughs> hey, she's back. <laughs> okay, so, so so this is like a really uh, I don't know uplifting moment for me because like I work on AI ethics for a bit and at the beginning, like a few years ago, a lot of the narrative, a lot of the research, particularly, had been done uh, focused on topics such as super intelligence. I think you all heard about this. No? When machines are going to be smarter than humans? When is going to be the singularity? Is there going to be like an intelligence explosion? No? Or even the moral status of machines, if they're going to be like moral person and they are going to be legally binded to the system or whatnot. Uh, and those were put forward for a time as central issues for AI ethics and uh, they've been linked with like research that is called existential risks. So there are whole areas of research that are like focused on this. Uh, but there's a critique to all of these approaches. And now I like this name that I, I first time saw coined by Kate Cutford, uh, which is white guys problems. So this approach to AI ethics is coming from a perspective for why males that are uh, based on elite institutions, mainly from the global north. 
uh, and they, I don't know, they have controlled the narrative and they have controlled the funding for a really long time because funding is important to do a lot of work. Uh, so I, I wanted to pose to you, Nadine, per particularly to begin, because I think you already t talk about uh, your ideas, Regen, but what's your pers from your own perspective and experience, which are perhaps, I don't know if you agree with these other problems that I <laughs> mentioned before, but which are mo some of the most pressing issues related to AI, big data, and digital technologies uh, at this time? <laughs> so. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I agree with what both Rayan and uh, you have uh, said. And I also just wanted to add that from our own work, what we think is that we all know that there is a problem of neocolonization in the data and AI paradigm, so much so that uh, the neocolonialism of data has itself become a buzzword and even World Economic Forum is using our vocabulary. So it's a very scary moment about we need to define the problem precisely. Uh, I think that the moment compels us to uh, understand that there is both a material and an epistemic injustice in this particular moment of uh, uh, neocolonization. And the material injustice, okay, there's digital empire, there are like two countries that dominate the entire digital economy and others are dependent on them. There is like growing market concentration. I won't get into all the stats because I'm sure Sure, we all read like thousand times a day what GAFAM is up to and how concentration is only growing at every layer of tech. But one thing I would like to speak about is something Rayan pointed out where actually life is about messiness. Life is about like the celebration of the unruly. But this is where I'm really, really worried about that there's an emerging regime of neocolonial reason where there is a particular algorithmic disciplining right and one could say that we are witnessing the consolidation of a new regime of reason and its USP is the generation of data phenotypes that will recursively regenerate social difference in hyper specific ways. Meaning uh, if there is a particular credit scoring company out of an entire population, we can in a pan spectronic way now identify who are all to be ranked in particular ways. You can create like these particular type of group profiles that was never possible before the data age in so many ways. Some people might argue that this is a very old problem and even when uh, colonial nations went everywhere, there was statistical reason and governmentality they created everywhere through the census of uh, colonial populations and all these things. But we have to understand that those, that old statistical reason moved from particular to general insights, but here we move from the particular to particular and we are actually able to see new kinds of like truth claims where like someone said, it's almost like there is a new ontology of knowing the world and that is this algorithmic way of slicing and dicing the world and only that is truth and nothing else. And I think that this particular moment, what's happening is that uh, there is an enclosure of collective social knowledge for new opening up new grounds for capitalist expansion. And we are seeing this not just in labor relations, but also in life worlds and sociality itself. And then this is about the question of human dignity and autonomy, because we deny intelligence and knowledgeability to subjects at the margins of this data empire, black subjects, indigenous populations, the in saying the poor, the disabled, and you see like a replication of a whole range of like social uh, hierarchies and their sedimentation. And somehow this is like a reason where public reason is no longer possible through deliberation and democratic dialogue. And instead we have a corporate controlled algorithmic black box, which kind of slices and dices our entire world and determines uh, what is, uh, you know, the truth. Uh, the second issue and the last issue in this context I would like to place on the table is this ecological exploitation and decimation of life worlds that this uh, paradigm uh, means uh, because 
there are so many types of issues that we don't discuss or come to mind when we talk about ecological exploitation because typically we are talking about a just green transition and greenhouse gas emissions water consumption energy footprints but actually what about things like if big tech is controlling agricultural value chains in the global south and then it's actually displacing culturally specific local economies of reciprocity into a disembedded globalized uh, on the world of big uh, agri and big tech led like you know uh, industrialization of that entire sector and what does this mean for marginal and small farmers particularly women's farmers in the south and we are seeing these things in india in the philippines and there are uh, so many real and everyday uh, problems and so i think one of the issues uh, is also about when we talk about data colonization uh, what is at, you know in the spotlight is it only questions of the politics of recognition or are we able to tie together the recognition and redistributive injustice questions together so these are some of like the issues that come to mind great uh, well thanks uh, i'm I'm really like, I don't know, it really resonates with me because uh, in Latin America, we're having uh, the same discussions <laughs> like that all the people in the global south are having. And for us, uh, it's, uh, as you said, like for us, uh, a lot of the conversation has been about this idea of modernity and how this idea of colonial modern system is the one that is overruling everything and how it relates patriarchy with capitalism and coloniality. And they're all like kind of the three uh, like sides of the same thing. They're not separate, they're like intertwined. So in order to understand and kind of work and resist, we have to resist these three axes at the same time and how this system has created the devaluation or the negation of humanity of certain populations and it has uh, disregarded certain territories, particularly these within the global south and what's happening with mining, what's happening with like the exploitation of labor, no? So I was thinking uh, if you perhaps, <laughs> I don't know you, Ryan, uh, can think about like how perhaps feminism and the colonial theories can like help us perhaps not only understand some of these issues but turn them into practices because what I think is very powerful about these ideas is that they're not only in theory, they always come with practical applications and ways of doing and resisting. So I wonder if you wanted to share some ideas with us. Well, I'm going to come back a bit to the concept so we can like go through a few of them that I think are very relevant. And I want to show uh, through your question, uh, Sophia, a bit how through our projects we try to bring these ideas into practice. And then I think it would be also great to discuss with you if there are questions or like ideas to, to complement what Nadine and Sophia and me are sharing today. Um, it's coming? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to speak about the projects, but I think something really important that was mentioned uh, through Nadine and Sophia, which I also want to bring um, into the whole uh, discussion, is when I talk about like hope, Joe, and, and this whole perspective area, I think is something that really relevant we realize uh, in the work with radical data and also uh, on how to bring a new. Um, bring this uh, perspective into practice is that we feel and we realize through uh, talking and and reading and all these things is that the control of the narrative that exists right now in data uh, in society and technology and how the relevance of like queer decolonial and feminist practices are towards building that new narrative because we think there is, we feel that there is this very strong like binary perspective, which is rather the um, utopian real revolution that uh, big tech is selling us, right? Like uh, jobs are going to be better, uh, things are going to be cheaper, things are going to be automated, and like the whole idea of like this is going to sell us a better future. But at the same time, there is like this the other side of the spectrum, which is this very strong dystopia that we see in the narrative through social media, also through some NGO activism, which is like 
this is just here to oppress us and we're just going to be oppressed. And we feel that both narratives lead us towards a completely, as completely passive as spectators. And something I think is very strong about my experience as a person from the Global South, living here and thinking about these issues, is that we need to be active agents towards changing this narrative and toward like, empowering or using these technologies, uh, approaching these spaces without much permission and just with the, like, the collectivity and building a movement that can um, be connected with some of these very relevant questions that are being historically with us. And this is also that for me comes very strongly from the history of the Global South in the history of also like, of course, being like colonized continents, countries, oppressed people, uh, and the whole history and massacre that have ex experienced our, our, our lands, is that in there is something to look at the past as well. Like the things that are happening right now, of course, with technology, are not things that are, comp are new to this era, right? Surveillance, jo job displacement, misinformation, are th as an example, are things that are being with us in the Global South from ages ago. So it's not something that is nuanced and that we need to like, just be afraid of in the sense of like, this is something that we really don't know. It's because there are traces in our history about resistance, about people organizing towards those problems, and there have been responses before. So also in the Global South activism, we also try to look at, in the past, how those responses have existed before. We are also building with Radical Data a project about this called the Museum of Data, trying to bring all those stories to the present and look that the things that are happening right now are not new, instead connected with a history of oppression that we already have experienced in the Global South. So, considering, of course, if there are after questions, we can go into things that is a lot of to, to, to explain, and I don't wanna just like take uh, so much time, but uh, there are, think here there's just like words and feels a bit disattached but there is uh, much root on the way that we have experienced activisms in the global south and the way we try to bring them to the area of data and technology so i'm going to bring those questions to some of the um, projects we are doing so then we can also see how those things kind of drive us into our practices so this is one project we are doing called self which is uh, coming from another project of research called Queering the Quantified Self, which uh, looks into bodies, health apps, health data, and how we can think on alternatives. So this is very much rooted, for example, in the idea of like collectivity towards um, building alternatives and new narratives in the area of data and technology activism, which is like from the experiences of disabled bodies, bodies with chronic illnesses, with mental health issues, we have thought about how data can be useful to understand our bodies, how tracking ourselves, tracking our emotions, tracking our experiences can be useful to understand what is happening within our bodies. But when I tried to look outside what was in the health apps options, I just saw very narrow, very stereotypical bodies, very not very big issues with privacy from period trackers for is the biggest example for me and i couldn't see anything that i could actually explore that is outside of the narrative of self optimization and hyper productivity so through this uh, project we started researching just at the beginning, it was just reading, then trying ourselves in our bodies, then building a Telegram group with friends, then giving workshops about the topic with different communities, and very interdisciplinar. And then, through those experiences, we decided to start building a tool, because we realized that there was nothing out there that could help us to track our non-normative bodies that was completely safe and private, and that could help us to build also a collectivity towards the problems that uh, the pandemic of, for example, mental health exists right now. Like there, was, there were no options in the area of technology or outside that could help us to think about health as a systemic problem, not just as an individual one. So self is one of the projects we are right now developing uh, with a bunch of questions, but trying out how this idea of collectivity, how non-normativity, how thinking about um, the body not separated of our, um, from our mind, not splitting our body in different body parts, instead of like trying to do, think through, as Nadine said, through the messiness of our bodies and our day-by-day -day life, 
and the relationship with technology that can also relate with all those problems. The other one we are doing right now that is also very related with some of the topics is a project called Holding Hands Through Machines Made to Chop Our Hands, which is a project uh, we just started a few months ago, uh, also because of a fellowship we are doing in the Netherlands. And it's about looks at um, precarious digital work, especially in the platform of Mechanical Turk, and how uh, the, I mean, the labor that is behind the internet, the labor that is right now used in such a way, uh, for example, to uh, build AI, and how much precar precarious. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's a sign. How much precarity, I think precarity or precariousness, <laughs> I don't know, um, is behind those practices. And it's a platform that especially for us shows like the de this dehumanization of, um, of labor and relationships. And it's just like, well, it's just like numbers and robots, you know. So we are wondering how we can create an intervention on spaces like that. Can we build an union? Can we make friendships? Can we build maybe an artwork? But the question is like, for me, there are two things relevant in this project to bring now. One is the unknown. It's like entering into a space without not necessarily knowing what is the goal or what will be the result of an initiative or a project. Instead, building up with people and thinking through what are the relevant movements we can do on those spaces. And the second one is about interdisciplinarity. And it's about like working with different people, which is in this case, the workers of the platform, to build things from the needs, from the questions who we, of people who is inhabiting those spaces and try to think what, which movements we can and we need to organize to make these spaces, to transform them or maybe to destroy them, I don't know, but like to make alternatives from those experiences. And to finish up, the third one is the uh, project called the Museum of Stolen Artifacts, which is also a project we are being developing from the last months, which looks at colonial objects and artifacts that live in European museums still until today, and try to create a platform, actually a museum also, like trying to reappropriate the concept of a museum, of a platform not just to um, reappropriate from those communities the objects that are still in those in colonial museums like the British Museum or in the Netherlands or in Germany uh, mainly and, and Belgium. Um, also as a platform for, um, for the whole process of reappropriation, for the whole process of repatriation. It means like collecting legal documents, connecting organizations, connect because right now there, there are being initiatives but they are just all split and spread. So we want to connect them. We want to create a, also like the first database of all those stolen artifacts and call them a stole as well because they are being stolen. And um, also we want to look at, um, at the colonial moral that is behind those process of being, uh, keeping those objects still now in those museums and how they are being responding also to the people who is being trying to reclaim them. So it's also trying to use data from experience. Also, we are working with a community from Rapa Nui, which is an island from the Polynesia that is in Chile, and figuring out with them what, well, in this case, how to bring the Moai back to Chile, and also how to work with other communities that are also trying to reclaim their objects. So this is an overview of possible, in our case, ways of applying those ethics, those applying those ideas that are not just concepts, instead of like, it's really like an um, embodied experience of things that a lot of the people in the Global South have experienced in their own activisms, in their own communities. And they are, from my perspective, and I think from also the people, a key impulse, a key way of ethically related from a different way into data activism that we think is very, very powerful to build change. Thank you. Great, thanks. So, no, it's very interesting because now there's this over, like, hegemonic narrative that AI will help us solve virtually all problems in the world, from like climate change, gender gap, everything. You know, and it's important to to relate this with exploited bodies, with exploited territories, but to come up with different ways, with different yeah. solutions, with different ways of thinking of how to use technology and how to think of the world and 
construct something different. So in that uh, tone, I wanted to ask now, uh, Nadini, if uh, you had some reflections, perhaps I, in the same line that we were thinking here or talking now, uh, on emancipation, no? uh, on, on how it relates. Does it really relate to technology, to which technologies, perhaps? I don't know if, if you have learned something from the projects that you've done. Is it digital technologies, uh, the ones that we really need, or is it other types of technologies? And I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah. Um, I think that if there's anything we have learned in the past 20, 25 years, as the arc of the digital revolution has unfolded, it is that these very millennial type of visions about how technologies will automatically become magic bullets for development problems and all the ills of the world, that's not really, you know, panning out anywhere. And it's also clear that even in documents like this uh, sustainable development goals document when there's a vision of uh, technologies as a neutral tools that's really wrong because what's happening here is a paradigmatic shift it's a civilizational shift that we are seeing and our responses need to be like that so since it's becoming clearer by the day what is wrong with the emerging data and AI paradigm, if we want to give it that kind of name, because these technologies and the platformization, datafication, and algorithmic control processes dominate, like, you know, the entire way our world is structured. Uh, I want to bring back one thing when thinking about visions of emancipation, which relates to the title of the panel uh, as well. And here I want to throw in a provocation for all of us. Is the defense of human rights uh, emancipatory vision enough? I mean, is it enough to just talk about like, you know, the human rights language to a uh, kind of reclaim the AI paradigm? And I want to submit here that, especially going by the European uh, experience, because EU likes to position itself as a defender of a human rights approach to data and AI, I would like to kind of like offer this provocation that the liberal human rights script may not be enough to kind of like reclaim visions of emancipation emancipation and this is because of uh, three shortcomings it has number one there is this ex exclusive uh, focus on personal autonomy and individual harm where we are not able to adequately recognize that there are material structural conditions which lead to collective harm in a particular like societal setup and this is not high theory i would like to offer two practical examples uh, i'm sure everyone in the room was reading in the digital services act uh, debates how we uh, we really did not go very far in challenging the basics of the surveillance model of social media. The compromise is not like really like, you know, happy enough. Finally, what that act struck when it goes into the final stage. Uh, secondly, if you look at the AI Act, we are not able to kind of imagine societal access to just, justice right in the AI context, which exists in other legislation like the Arhes Convention on the Environment, for instance, where all members of society without the need to demonstrate proof of individual or collective harm suffered would enjoy the right to challenge public decisions that were made without complying with societal participation rights we don't seem to have that and the human rights framework is not like really permitting us to legislate like that uh, the second point is that the legal formalism of human rights due diligence regimes has led to a problem we all know where states in the international order are not able to contain the economic crimes of the intelligent corporations of the AI age and less said about that the better. And the third point is that just like in the 1970s and 80s, those of us in the South watched the neutrality and formalism of international law use human rights as a decoy to open up markets and which in a way that just led to neocolonial economic relations of subjugation. We see the same narratives of open data for development being deployed by the powerful blocs such as the OECD for the interest of the most powerful nations. 
So you might have seen these OECD data sharing guidelines, which push for keeping data as open as possible to maximize their benefits and as close as necessary to protect legitimate public and private interests. And we actually see that the selective openness will further AI coloniality, where data commons of the global south is enclosed without any rights of the populations of the south to demand like any returns. And uh, in the north, IP rights are still protected for these powerful corporations. We see the same in digital trade rules as well. So how do we actually achieve uh, structural justice, which can be uh, a vision for emancipation? And there I think that, you know, uh, it's very important to look at like a different institutional order. Are we able to imagine a different type of model where the way we use uh, the affordances of network data and AI technologies, that leads to collective intelligence being used for changing the way we organize production and social reproduction, for more commonsification, for building flourishing democracies. And here, from our own work, what we think is that oftentimes there is a tendency to think about the act of commonsification and the demands for public infrastructure creation as polar opposites and as agendas that can never come together. One very big learning for us is that public infrastructure can actually pr provide like very successful scaffolding for like bottom up commons uh, projects and i don't need to say more about that considering where we are all sitting and having this uh, conversation and uh, the second uh, point also uh, is that when we think ab think about like commonsifying digital and network and data technologies we somehow think that the public policy conversation is not like really relevant or any uh, traditions about the digital governance paradigm and shifting it is seen as uh, leading to somehow, somehow greater multilateral control. In my, in my organization for the past 20 years, what we have been trying to do is to actually argue about how there are some ground rules that we need at the global level to prevent this complete like scramble for data. And we need to probably think of like moving digital public policy in certain directions. So working at both the policy level and practice level is probably equally important in fighting the structural uh, injustice. And I would like to know everyone uh, thoughts on this as well and just stopping here great thank you so yeah with that i was uh wondering if now now we'll open the the panel to questions to comments if anyone wants to intervene uh, <laughs> yes thank you um Thanks for your, your talk. It was absolutely inspiring and really great. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the viability of the commons or how to build uh, behind all the, the examples you behind all the examples of the projects you, you showed. How to actually build them in a viable economic way? Because decolonialism is about fighting pillage, basically. <laughs> colonialism is village. So there's a value chain here which I which I would like to know more about. Thank you. Yep. I don't know either <laughs> of you would like to Yeah. Uh, sorry. Oh we got more questions. Oh wait. I wanted to address Nandini, what Nandini said. Um, you said quite a lot with your um, provocation. <laughs> um, however, for me, it's very interesting, this constant use of the word emancipatory. It's like this vision that we have where we are free. And sometimes I think when we create these visions, we are, we're almost divorced from our present reality. Like emancipation is a concrete reality given what we're seeing on the news right now happening in Israel and Palestine. Um, when we think about each of our concrete regions in the global south, when we think about, well, I, I'm Southeast Asian, so if I think about Southeast Asia, I can tell you concretely what emancipation looks like for me. And I think that within what, within this structure, for me, it is 
amazing the collective intelligence, computational power of the global majority, I think the issue is where the wealth goes and who gets to dictate how that wealth is used and why. Um, and to also think about, yes, I also very much agree with, with AI seems to supersede all of the previous conversations we've had about colonialism, about categorization. We don't have to talk about it because if we, do, if we talk about it, it'll slow AI down. And I wonder if AI is in, in itself sometimes a decoy because we already have answers to so many of the questions. Okay, yeah. I, should we take these two? Like, um, I, don't, I don't know. If yeah, I mean, we can answer just like different parts. Um, <laughs> I, I may be gonna stick, I, I, don't, I didn't understand if there was a question, or it's like a more like comment to comment. <laughs> yeah, great, it's all right. Um, I'm interested on, on also commenting your question, which I think, sorry, I don't know your name. Luciano. Um, I think something that is also very from uh, my Latin American experience is like the, in, it's also in the principles, it's like the idea of like using what we have and like the, for me also the idea of like low tech is also very related somehow, you know, like um, that involves that, um, in, in the case of radical data, we try to work like with cheap things, you know, like cheap technology, which is very part, very much part of our ethics, you know, it's a choice and about not building like, soup, like, well, also be, because uh, we were, I was reviewing the, the low tech manifesto the other day about this and like how also some, like how some of the latest technologies, um, for example, that you see in our pieces at the end are just like also like a sales room for the latest technology, you know, and I think in that sense for us it's really important to keep um, in the cheap side of things, in the easy side of things, where things that needs like very small data to charge, you know, because also for example in the communities when we were thinking about self as well and we were building also like a Telegram bot parallel one like that, you can just use that because uh, something, I, I don't know how it's in other continents, but at least in Latin America, most of the phone companies, you don't, you pay, uh, f you have free WhatsApp, like free social media, but you don't have internet to enter like Firefox or like you, the, the browser. So it was a very important for us to build things also that can be used on WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal, you know, and not just an app that needs uh, data to connect, for example, you know, because we know that the people who also we want to reach not, doesn't have necessarily access to or Wi-Fi or data in their phones. Um, so we were trying to build as much simple and cheap options, you know, for, for example, for self. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much like, and the, the other side, it's like that's a practical example, but also I think something that comes from our way of activism in Latin America is this, this is also sometimes quite problematic to say, but like it's also like, I don't think really like we need money or necessarily like a big funding to do our fights, you know, like resources come from everywhere and come from people that is sometimes working in a place and they can give you the password, they can give you the resources, whatever, you know, you work with what you have, but we don't wait for fundings, we don't want to wait for governments to give us the money, we don't wait for NGOs to give us the money, we just do it, you know, and I think that is not just about the money, one, two, three, you know, it's about an ethics of like, we need to do this. It's not like, ah, oh, we, we can wait six months. It's a need. We need to do it now, and we just do it, you know? So I think in that sense, the cheap, the low tech, and the idea of community organization as the biggest resource, um, it's very important for us. Do you want to add something to, to the previous two comments, or do you want us to take more questions? I just want to add a couple of quick points to respond to the second question. Uh, so uh, I wanted to thank you for pointing out this problem with using emancipation loosely, because I completely agree that uh, the idea of utopia is actually frankly terrifying. And we all know where the 
two greatest uh, utopic visions of the 20th century where that led all of us. So I agree that we have to be careful about how we define it. And that's completely right. And I just want to give something like from our grounded experience. Uh, so last year, like from my organization and the feminist network development alternatives with women for a new era, we had this uh, global working group where we were working over 12 to 14 months on thinking about if we had to define feminist digital justice, what would it mean from our different policy and practice locations in the South? And uh, what was felt was that finally in the group, and you know, the group came out with some kind of vision statement. So there was this entire idea that if like the social knowledge that AI produces, it can result in the kind of understanding that drives like the underground forest networks of roots and fungi, the symbiotic relationship, rather than predatory corporate intelligence. Maybe that's the kind of world we are talking about if we are looking at AI as a new paradigm of how social knowledge gets like created and used and this is what's happening. But having said that, yes, I also share the skepticism about AI being a decoy. Uh, in May, we were in a conversation at this UN Science, Technology and Innovation Forum where there was this entire panel about finding use cases for generative AIs for sustainable development. So you put the tech, tech in front and then you kind of see, uh, can I apply this to improve uh, health worker skills in India and make AI co-pilots work with them? Can I do this? And it's never about, can I invest that money in building the capabilities of the health workers themselves and make them agentic, like my friend Rayan was saying earlier in the panel, because where is the uh, agency and that question we are talking about? So yeah, those were some of the thoughts and I shared these dilemmas too. Thanks. Uh, I, don't know. I don't know. How is the time? Do we have more time for questions? Or? Oh, we have five minutes. Great. <laughs> Any other comment or question or little dance or whatever? <laughs> there is one there. Oh, and we have two. two. Woo! <laughs> Success. <laughs> Okay. Uh, sorry, my my question is is uh, about the the problems of white uh, female from the north. So probably it's not exactly the, the right uh, venue to ask. But um, I thought maybe uh, we could share some thoughts. Um, I am a female scientist on on IT, so. Uh, I have to be in every committee because we have this gender balance and, and I am struggling to survive, uh, to do my work and then being as a representative to this minority. Um, so I, I would like to ask you, uh, you are asking for, for being present in, 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 in the decision making, to, to, to have a voice, to have a, uh, empowerment, but uh, what happens when the minority is not able to handle, uh, when they ask you to, to, to be present and you cannot handle it because it's too much? Uh, any thoughts on, on this? So I am asking more in terms of gender issues than South and North, sorry for that, but I was curious about what is your position as a female um, actor? Um, what is the solution? Is it just an, a paradox that we cannot solve? Or <laughs> can we do something about that? So should we say, no, I am too busy? Or should we just go because we have the opportunity to, to be there? What yeah. is the answer? Um, you're the panelist. That. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for me, it's like I don't have a very big answer because like I don't inhabit like institutional spaces that much so like I haven't experienced it uh, like in first person but I think you are bringing something really interesting that it's also related with like feminist ideas on self-care for example like how do we I don't know as I said my intuition is that yeah it is important to occupy the spaces but also it's important to put the boundaries to those spaces to say like I can't I don't want I'm exhausted or this is, I don't know, like the idea, the very problematic of like now, um, you know, um, how, how is it? Like how f feminism became also like this capitalist feminism and it's like using like all these spaces that 
we know that it's much more sometimes about checking boxes than actually engaging with the communities and the people. And um, I'm afraid that in your in your field that um, that affects that there is no much presence and more just like the idea of like we need to be represented there. Uh, but I th from my perspective, the system itself should change to make or more participation, like more people being there, or rather having a space for like the real self-care in the also in the in the system, you know, somehow. Um, yeah, but I don't know if you have something. I, I have some experience, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a panelist, but I guess I, <laughs> I'm going to say something. <laughs> no, for sure. no, because like, I've been in academia and the discussion that we have been having in Mexico is because especially they created all these new places where now you're going to have your voices heard. But it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and again, women's work is not considered work. So this is not giving you points for promotion. This is not considered things that are into your job. So you are allowed to take less classes if you're doing this. So it, it has to come with a rethinking of the way that these things are configured. Yeah. So people can actually like properly do this as work, not as extra bits that are going to be at top of everything else and they end up consuming everything. Because like I think a lot of people get invited to all these things and we get this impression. And I think, uh, I think they are, haven't been thought of from a feminist or like gender perspective. And I think that, is, that, that happens a lot with, uh, with the harassment like, like guidelines and with a lot of the things that have been thought of from a logic that doesn't really work. So I think there's hope in rethinking this as work, as giving it a right space so you can have time to devote to that and that will be part of your work and it will be considered as such. That, that, that's an idea. I, I don't know if Nandini has some comments there. Uh, is there more questions? Because we have okay. probably two minutes, we can just hear them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there was more, more one question, I think, over there. Yeah? No? Ah, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So no more questions, just to know if <laughs> can. Okay, cool. great. So do you not even want to comment that then? Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add to this uh, point that we were already discussing uh, that when we think about, uh, okay, so first let me begin with the uh, acknowledging the baseline problem that yes women not being there in stem fields and techno design being a white male dominated field like was already said in the beginning that is a basic uh, problem and we need to fix that but when we are thinking about inclusive design choices uh, why is it that we only think about like quota systems in expert committees and this is not just a problem of like digital technologies i think even in the environmental field it's like that right like when some tech environmental technology choices are made it's about like one independent civil society expert in a committee and things like that so what happens to the explainability of design choices what happens to the direct democracy questions and uh, you know getting like voices from below and all these things so we need to uh, probably have a better way of doing this than like you know the example we keep going to every time in the digital field which is this open multi-stakeholder communities of ICANN. So the self-selection in open and free culture is often very exclusionary, especially for women. And there are so many studies and direct observations about this. So how do we have a different kind of uh, open and free collaborative culture where we are actually listening to the voices from the edges and the tyranny of structurelessness is not leading to silencing? I think that's really the challenge for all of us, especially those who are trying to build alternative, maybe cooperativist tech and so on. Great. I think, I think it was a great ending to this panel. Thank you very much, both I of you. I just want to add, uh, yeah. just to say, like, no, to it's close over. that, no. um, <laughs> yeah, like that with Radical Data, we are always open to collaborations, and um, if there is anyone who is interested or any of that, uh, <laughs> we are happy, really, to just talk if there is a struggle, if there is a need, or also something I couldn't bring before, but also Nadine mentioned, is like, 
also to worry when, when technology is not the answer and it is something else, we are really, really happy to work with you. And there is one hand there very keen to speak, so I don't know what we do. <laughs> Okay, uh, good day. Uh, I speak in, in Spanish. Okay, yeah, go okay. first. To speak in Spanish. Uh, you know, when you are aware about all the effects of the AI, and uh, you are aware about the fake news, you realize that suddenly feminine gender and uh, or so to speak people uh, dressing like women because we are all similar sometimes it's used uh, the fake news and also to use the AI to make jokes or to use a part of the AI that uh, will make you to, to get nude and without clothes. I did experience myself and I had, you know, the my stomach with uh, perfect abs. I did it with AI. But some people, they take this like a joke and uh, others, they see it like a violation against human rights. When this AI is used to make jokes against women or the feminine sex and use it like a trophy or a tool for sex. What can we do all together for people uh, to change, but also how we can change as individuals when facing this uh, use of uh, the AI that can be uh, used by people uh, applying the AI with different goals that are not noble goals to improve prosperity and efficiency of humankind. Do we have to answer in Spanish or in English? Nandini, do you get the translation? No. No. No, I didn't get it. Very long comment. I don't know if you Should want to summarize? say something. Yeah, yeah you question? want to summarize? Yeah, <laughs> if I understand well. I'm, I'm, ¿Está bien si hablamos en inglés? Sí? Correct, if we speak English, or do you want me to answer in Spanish? Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize your question uh, a bit. If I, it was like, I think it's correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, you, or name, I don't know, but that person <laughs> is, sorry? Luis. Luis uh, is sharing like the issue on like the use of uh, AI on like fake creating fake images and creating fake news, especially on like uh, females or women's bodies, and how that is so problematic right now. It's so spread around, and uh, how do we how how do we deal with it somehow? Like this massive uh, issue now with like fake news and fake images, especially um, erasing women's bodies. Uh, is that a good summary? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to add something else to the question? No, I think that's right. okay. Do you want to answer? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think what Luis is saying, it's very related from my perspective with the first point that I was trying to bring, which is like, the issues we live right now with technology are not new issues. And they are problems that are rooted very much in our history as humans and society that is patriarchal, colonial, colonial sexist. Um, so I, I don't think like as uh, what is happening right now with like the massivity of, of uh, production of fake images, it is something so different to what we have already experienced in our whole history as female or non-binary bodies. Uh, I think from seeing that fake image into a phone to walking on the streets and feel erased or receiving so many different ways of violence, um, I, I feel that's just one more. In which sense? I don't want to say that we should not work against it. I think we should, but for me, the way of changing those problems is about understanding the root of them, which is patriarchy, is sexism, is machismo, 
and all those things, and those violence that are very much rooted on our society, which is not about AI, it's more, it's about these very basic problems. And as we are working, I think, in the whole panel that we were talking about, decolonial ideas, feminist ideas, to, um, to break these big paradigms, it's, we are working towards that problem, you know, about AI and fake images and fake news. But I think it's just like la punta del iceberg, you know, mm -hmm. of something that is pretty much rooted in many ways of violence that female, women, trans, and non-binary bodies receive in the world. Great. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I don't know, Nandini, you want to say something? Okay. Because so this okay, is going to be the last one. Now we're actually, yeah, 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 we're actually going to get receiving. drinks. Yeah. <laughs> So should we close? Oh, no, do you want to say something? Nadine, I think you, you have a go now, if you uh, still okay, want. Uh, yeah. I'll just take uh, 30 seconds of <laughs> what I understood of the question through the translation. Thanks for that. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I think that uh, there are, uh, yeah, it's part of an older problem. I agree. But the two newer dimensions we could consider is because of algorithmic virality and the affordances that generative AI gives us now, which may not have been there now, the problem really is we no longer know how to govern the public sphere because we don't want state censorship but we don't want absolute like impunity and in a way where it's just like algorithmic enclaves of hate proliferate and proliferate and maybe this needs like an entire discussion by itself about how do you reclaim the spirit of democracy and like you know public participation and freedom from violence as a part of the right to free expression thinking about these things in the digital public sphere because uh, is something qualitatively changes for us and we need to rethink the ways of like uh, free speech regulation from earlier times. Amazing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sure, your sure. time and for being here. Yay. For all of Thank you, you so time. much. <laughs> Bye, Nadine. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>